On this week's Hockey Inside Out, would you trust Mark Bergevin to rebuild the Canadians if you were Jeff Molson? I think we all know the answer to that question. Welcome to this week's show. I am Adam Susser, and joining me today is Stu Cowan, CBC Daybreak's Jessica Resnick. And joining us once again, it's been a while since you've last been on the show, joining me for the first time. He was drafted first overall by the Washington Capitals in 1976. He joined the Montreal Canadiens in 1982, a year before I was born. How does that make you feel? <laughs> oh, don't mention those numbers. We'll discuss that more in detail later. Uh, former NHL defenseman, Mr. Rick Green. Thanks for joining us today, Rick. Pleasure. Okay. Here are this week's talking points. Number one, is there anyone on the Canadians who should be untouchable at the trade deadline? Number two, what are your takeaways from Tuesday night's win against the Avalanche? Number three, what's your biggest concern about the Canadians' defense core? Number four, seeing as they probably won't make the playoffs this year, which prospects should the Habs look at calling up for the remainder of the season? And number five, should Jeff Molson allow GM Mark Bergevin to be in charge of a rebuild if the team decides to take that route? Let's start the show. When I wrote this week's monologue before Tuesday night's win over the Avalanche, there was only a 1.3% chance of the Habs making the playoffs this year. But coming into work today, I was pleasantly surprised when my colleagues told me that the Habs more than doubled their chances of making the playoffs with last night's win over at the Colorado Avalanche. That's right, they're now at a 3% chance. <laughs> I like them odds, guys. You like them? <laughs> You're saying there's a chance. <laughs> exactly. You're saying there's a chance. So assuming the Habs are not able to maintain that momentum from the Colorado game, they will be enthusiastic sellers at the trade deadline or before the trade deadline on February 26th. So if that is the case, is there anyone on the Canadians who you think should be untouchable at the trade deadline, or is no one safe? <laughs> I, well, it's a young man's game today in the NHL, and I think you need to protect your young, good players like your Victor Metes, Alex Galchenyuk, as much as he's been through here, he can score. Lots of talk about trading Max Pacioretty, but on a team that can't score goals, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense to trade the guy who's your most consistent goal scorer. So are there untouchables? Yeah, I think so. But uh, I think he also Mark Bergeron needs to listen to any offers that come his way too. But I wouldn't trade away young talent. I would say that Brendan Gallagher to me is not a guy that you trade away. He's been playing really well on the ice, but he's also that spark plug that you could kind of put him with anyone and he's able to get their game going. I feel like he's one of the true leaders on this team, so he's not a guy to give away. But as Stu mentioned that you know Max Pacioretty's name has been the one that's been rumored the most, but you trade him away and then you have this hole, this big hole to fill. But I think if you can get something back from him, he's someone that you would definitely let go, but keep the, the younger movement because that's really where everything is going. And Max Pacioretty is going to be 30 next November. Yes, it's not super old, but if you can get some younger prospects for him, that might help down the road. Yep. Uh, I agree with you, Jessica, on the Gallagher side. You know, the guy is uh, the heart and soul right now of the Canadians, and he's just uh, shown it each and every night. So you really have to keep a guy like that. But on the other side, I think uh, there's a lot of guys. You mentioned Pacioretty. In order for you to get something back, you have to give something. And I think that uh, the way things have gone for this year, I think that they need to change some of the chemistry. I think they need to change some of their personnel. And in order to do that, you're going to have to give up some, some players that uh, you were hoping to do better this year, haven't done it, so maybe they're attractive somewhere else. If you can get that number one center for Pacioretty, mm -hmm. possibly, and then you move Drouin over and, and have Galchenyuk on the other wing, I think that might be a possibility. You mentioned Gallagher. Does he remind you of anybody you played with? Kind of like a, a Mike Keane, uh, if you will, just uh, kind of a, a gritty guy that comes to play every night and uh, you know what you're going to get out of him. And, you know, he's not very big and yet he's getting into the traffic area. He's hacking and chopping and he's knocked down. He gets back <laughs> up. And he always has that smile on his face. And he's just like, you know, go ahead, uh, punch me. I'm uh, going to get back <laughs> up and I'm going to come back at you. And you know what? It's There's no stopping him. So he's just a great uh, a great guy to have on your side and a pain to play against. <laughs> I would think so, exactly. So even if they did trade away Pacioretty, do you not think that them trading away their most consistent goal scorer, even for a center, would put them in more or less the same situation? Well, that, right it's now? one step forward, one step back kind of thing you know they brought in Jonathan Drouin and they lost Alexander Radulov and I keep wondering how good would Jonathan Drouin be if they'd kept Alexander Radulov I don't think when he signed Drouin I don't know if the plan was to lose Radulov or what it was at the point at that point but yeah it's it's you're losing your most consistent goal scoring wherever Max Pacioretty goes if he is traded if he plays with a legitimate number one center he's going to score 35 goals minimum mm 
Uh, you know, he's, what he's done here without having a real number one center, playing with Philip Deneau, playing with David Dayer, and I don't knock on those guys, but they're not legitimate number one centers in the NHL. He can score, and there's not a lot of guys in the NHL who are natural goal scorers. And less pressure as well, because he's always mm -hmm. talked about dealing with the pressure and the mental side of the game that has uh, sometimes hurt Max Pacioretty's uh, ability to score goals. Okay, so in other words, it would be a great move for Pacioretty if the Canadians <laughs> turned well, him Well, if, if Pacioretty was to go to a non-hockey market, like let's say like Radulov went to Dallas, and he wasn't the captain, and he wasn't mobbed by the media every day, and he wasn't, they just said, Max, go out and score 30 goals. I think it would be, life would be a lot easier for Max Pacioretty. But having said that, he loves playing in Montreal, and he makes it very clear he doesn't want to leave. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know him that well, but I, my impression from the personality that I see in him is he's, he's finding a real burden being the captain and, and, you know, struggling with what's going on individually and as a team. And uh, I think we all know that he, he's got the talent to score goals. But the bottom line is it's not happening, um, and sometimes you have to make changes and, uh, and, and you know, move forward. And the, the time of waiting for the future, the future is now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that it's really important to, to find a way to get some type of uh, player that's going to give you impact now. Easier said than done, but it's the time is now as... Your, your key guys are starting to get a little bit older. Price is getting a little bit older. Weber's getting a little bit older. You got guys that, uh, uh, you know, have uh, a, a limited number of years left. So you have to maximize the situation by trying to find a way to surround those guys with uh, with some, some good players and changing the chemistry. You know, Patrick has told me he's hearing the trade rumors and it sort of showed in his game against Colorado. He had more hits than he had <laughs> shots. He had five hits, which isn't what you'd expect to see from Max Pacioretty. So the Canadians ended the Avalanche's 10-game win streak on Tuesday night, one of the hottest teams in the NHL. I guess it's the little victories that we have to appreciate as Habs fans. What are some of your takeaways from that game? I think that everyone just seemed to play well. That it was an exciting game to watch as well. And, and prior to the game, I was talking to some people in media, and I said, we haven't had a really good game to watch probably since the earlier January when they played Tampa Bay. And then yesterday was one of those games that you were interested in. And when everyone's able to elevate their game, they're able to be a good team. Now they just have to find a way to do it consistently. Jonathan Drouin probably played his best game of uh, you know his time with the Canadians. I know you asked him mm -hmm. after the game, and he said that he's not sure that's his best game that he felt like maybe he's had better ones since but I think he was just being a little bit modest there you could be <laughs> and I think that you know uh, on the game sheet uh, your best players have to be your best players and they have to deliver every night if you're gonna have any success and uh, those guys did it Duran did it uh, had a had a great game but overall just looking at the performance I thought as a group everybody had an excellent game as far as their aggressiveness and their ability to use their speed and take away the speed of Colorado to the point where they got a little bit frustrated and that's a good team Colorado I mm -hmm. was quite impressed with them but uh, I was really impressed with the uh, the overall play of everybody on the Canadians which they have to look at as a, a bonus moving forward here to see if they can find a way to get that type of game and that that, that type of execution uh, from each and every guy if they want to uh, scratch themselves back into uh, three percent. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, Colorado had won 10 games in a row coming in. They also played the night before in Toronto, so they were probably a little bit tired, but that's the, you got to jump on a team like that, and that's what the Canadians did. And the thing I found interesting was Nicolas Delorier. Who would have thought it would be Nicolas Delorier to light a spark with Jonathan Drouet and Alice Galchenyuk, but uh, since he's come into the lineup, he's been a breath of fresh air. He finishes his hits. He's leading the NHL in average hits per game with 4.3. He's got seven goals in 28 games. He's just been, a, in what has been a lousy season for the Canadians and their fans, he's been such a pleasant surprise. It's yeah. like he's a guy, he's just happy to be there, and he knows when would he ever thought that he'd be playing on a line with Jonathan Drouet and Alex Galchenyuk, so why not make the best of it? And, and I think it's obvious, you, you know what you're gonna get from him, because every game that he plays, he's involved, he's finishing his check, He's going to the net, he's creating opportunities, and uh, there's a guy that uh, understands what work is, there's a guy that understands how to play within his, within his limitations, so I give that guy full marks, and uh, I'd, I'd love to have him uh, on, on my team. And this is a guy who was a defenseman right up until he got drafted in the mm -hmm. NHL, and you can tell he's not used to scoring goals by his goal celebration the other night when he fell on his butt going into the corner. <laughs> his <laughs> team <laughs> goes the other direction. But there's, there's an, another example of how intelligent defensemen are, because they can make that transition from <laughs> to offense without even, you know, missing.
chasing a beat. So, uh, what can I say? So, yeah. Rick, I'll uh, start by asking you this question because you played as a defenseman in the NHL for 15 seasons. What are your biggest concerns with the defense core on the Habs this year? I I notice uh, their lack of uh, aggressiveness, stick on stick uh, work, meaning. I never like to see the opposition have the opportunity to go from the top of the circle and let a shot go to, to you know, create either a goal or a scoring chance. The defense, uh, I feel, rather than getting caught in between, have to aggressively attack the, the, the shooter in a way that they're going to force the shooter to make either a bad pass or they're going to either deflect the puck up and out of, uh, out of play. And I find that they're, they haven't been consistently good at that. And I think that's an area that uh, I'm quite sure Claude has touched on. And it's an area that they have to get better at consistently if they're going to try and eliminate scoring chances against and uh, shut down some of the, the bigger offensive-minded uh, teams. So that area, along with their uh, ability to battle guys in front of the net, there's no way in the world that the opposition, other than it does happen, should get second wax at a rebound. The rebound has to be the responsibility of the defense. If Price can see the puck, or whoever's in the net, if he can see the puck, he'll stop it, but there's no way opposition should get to rebound. So there's a price to be paid for that, meaning positionally be close, uh, be aggressive on loose pucks to make sure you're the one that's getting the loose puck and you're not watching the opposition guys stand there and say, okay, uh, I have time and I have the space and I'm going to do what I want with it. So th those two areas are a concern for me and uh, they always have been and hopefully they'll, uh, they'll, they'll figure out that that is going to be critical in their, uh, in their play to, uh, to shut, down, shut down a lot of the teams. Okay. They need to play a little bit more like Rick Green. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, I think everybody kind of knew where I would be. And, yeah. uh, you know, so, similar to, and I always talk about uh, Shea Weber, there's, there's a classic example of a guy that is always in the right position at, at the right time and he forces all the other forwards that have to go through him to get to the net. And I think if you position yourself uh, like that, and hopefully some of the guys can feed off of that, you're, you're always going to be in the right position, and you're always going to be the one to, uh, uh, to eliminate scoring chances and uh, you know, shut, down, shut down the offense on the other side. Okay. So given the improbable chance that there is of the Habs are realistically making the playoffs this year, what prospects do you think they should take a look at calling up for the remainder of the season? Oh, there's not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think they've already done it. Yeah, well, they're Sherbach, all here. Sherbach is, is one, and, and the only other one really is Noah Juleson, who broke his foot the first, the first preseason game of the year, former first-round pick, and you know, obviously set back then. But apart from that, there's Lynn yeah. Pickens on the farm. Yeah, well, I agree. Yeah, well, I'm surprised that Nikita Sherbach hasn't got another call-up because when he was called up, that's when he did get injured and uh, then went back down and was rehabbed with uh, the Laval Rocket and playing there that, you know, he's another first round pick. Let's see what they're able to do. And at this point of the season, what harm can that really do this team? And if it could any, maybe it'll have the same sort of effect as when Nicola Delorier is called up and you see a guy who's really trying to earn his spot and making other people competitive because they're worried about losing their spot. So uh, Sherback would be one. And like Noah Juleson as well, it'd be interesting to see what he can do at the NHL level. Well, I... I went to see one of the games in Laval and I, I did see Sherback and to talk about Sh Sherback and Delorier in the same vein I think is, <laughs> is, is pushing a little bit personally because uh, Delorier hungry, uh, wants it and is really, really motivated to be part of the uh, Montreal Canadiens. Sherback on the other side, I'm not sure that he has that same drive skills, but uh, at least without judging too quickly on a, on a first impression, I was like going big, he's got skill, but you got to use it. And Do some of these first rounders sometimes have like this entitlement that they feel like because they're a first round pick and they know the organization is maybe giving them more opportunities than others? Well, maybe, but then it, it comes a point in time where if you're given opportunity, how much more can you give them? And they have to understand that uh, they have to perform now. The expectations are there to do something now. Uh, and that's, that's the name of the game. You, you can't wait and, you know, uh, let the opportunity go by. I mean, he's got to, he's got to grab a, a hold of his chance and he's got to show what he can show. And 
If not, you you, you got to make decision on some of these guys, and uh, I think that that goes with a lot of their players through the uh, organization. In coaching some of them, you can bring them so far, but then you have to make a decision on okay, how much farther can he go, or is he not going to get much better? And sometimes it's, you need a little luck on your side to have that happen because some are late bloomers, but on the other side, you have to say, you know what, I don't think this guy's going to be that good. I don't think we can get him to that level. So you have to make change. Well, and I was in St. John's a couple of seasons ago, and the feeling about Sure back then was that his work ethic, both on and off the ice, left something to be desired. And a case of sometimes, I think, with these first round picks, it's been easy for them their whole life. They've been the best player on their hockey team since they were five years old. They just they just went on the ice and they were the best. Then you get to the AHL level and I think some of the junior kids don't realize it's professional hockey. You're playing against men who are fighting to put food on the table for their kids who are fighting for the contract. You're not playing kids in junior anymore. And I think that might be where Sherbeck mm -hmm. thought he'd get to the AHL and it would be easy. It's two years later. You hope he's learned that it's not easy now and he'll move forward. But I think that was the problem with him going. Yeah. going. And I, I, I don't disagree with it. Some, you know, mature quicker than others. Mm -hmm. Some are able to make that adjustment uh, earlier than others and you you have to be careful that you don't pass judgment too quickly mm -hmm. but you'd like to see the bottom line is you got to see effort and desperation and trying to make the difference and try to get better as uh, as a player and uh you know contribute the best that you can contribute given your chance so uh, fans have been calling for his head all season if the canadians decide to do a rebuild should Jeff Molson let Mark Berger be, be the man to do that? I think, I think that might happen, but I think if, if Jeff Molson's going to let Mark Berger have another five-year plan, uh, he has to have somebody in between him and Bergevin. I think he needs to hire, if not a, a president of hockey operations, a consultant. Hire somebody just as a consultant and sit down with Bergevin and say, okay, what's your plan? What are, we, what are we doing now moving forward? And this, I think, has to be done before the trade deadline comes. What are your plans moving forward? And if he passes that test and Molson decides to let him stay, but I mean, as I say, it's six years into a five-year plan and they're as bad as they were when he first got here. So I think you need to start looking towards someone else. But again, the, the candidates are limited because of the language issue. It has to be somebody who's bilingual. So you've got to look who else is out there also. But I think they need somebody else that Bergevin or whoever the next GM is reports to between Molson and him. Well, I, I think uh, it's obvious that what's going on is it's not working. Mm -hmm. uh, so somebody has to be held accountable for it. And in that line of uh, work, you've got a lot of people that are under you that are supposed to be, whether it's finding players, developing players, uh, finding a way to get the best player that is available. Uh, is it happening? Probably not consistently enough. And this is a problem, Mary, that they're having, first of all, in the development of some of the young guys. Uh, some of the selections, as we know, haven't been the best. And they're paying for it. And other teams are, are finding ways to get quality kids with good upside. And they're playing in the NHL. And I don't think we're seeing enough of that uh, as an organization in Montreal that you, you get excited about some, some potential that's that's going to uh, be part of your uh, NHL hockey club. Okay. One of the names you hear also is Julien Brisebois as a possible replacement, the assistant in Tampa, obviously francophone, bilingual. Uh, my concern with, and I keep hearing his name, is another guy who has no experience as a general manager. He's been an assistant, same as Bergeron, he had no experience as a general manager when he came here, and that's, that concerns me. That's why I'm saying if you do replace him, who's out there to take his spot? There's not a lot of candidates And I available. think Jeff Molson's not ready to uh, break up with Mark Bergevin. I don't necessarily think he's lost all the faith in him. So I don't know. I would not be surprised if uh, if he's going to be the guy trying to put this retool in motion. What do you think, Stu? You think he's going to fire him, or is he sticking around? Uh, I. 50-50. I, I really don't know. I mean, the fact that if, if we go through the trade deadline and he lets him do the trades before, then I guess he's going to stay. I mean, it, it makes sense that you're going to yeah, keep him. Yeah, my feeling is. You know, give him to the the trading deadline. See if he can find a way to to change what he has with his group. And if not, uh, f uh, where do you go from there? It's uh, Jeff has some some serious questions to, like to talk that. about. We, we could end on where do you go from there. <laughs>
Thank you all for watching. That's our show today. Let us know if you'd give Mark Bejra the responsibility of rebuilding the team if you were president. That's right. I'm pretty much inviting you all to complain openly about Mark Bejra in our comment section. I'm Adam Susser, and I'll see you next Thursday. Okay.